Yeah. So you're right. There's a sombrero on the on the screen. So the whole idea of the interversity uh, is to work on a next generation uh, university, uh, which uh, should be self-organizing and a distributed university, but also, and that's why the sombrero is there, uh, playful and colorful. Um, and you can ask if that's really very academic, very. Um, if you just can do that, and I'll try to create an argument that it's actually a very natural uh, transition that's happening. So let me first of all just simply introduce so what we're going to talk about. So the university is uh, an alternative to university, uh, where the emphasis is on inter, which means between us, uh, uh, binding us. Uh, in uh, contrast to the university, where uh, the first part, universal, uh, stands for having universal knowledge. And with the acceleration of innovation and uh, the increased amount of uh, information you get all around you, that uh, increasingly be is becoming a, an impossible uh, thing to do. Even the biggest universities today only have a fraction of all the knowledge. It's, it's just impossible to get all the knowledge in one place. So what you see is that uh, universities have been created in a, in a more static uh, environment, while today we are uh, living with a lot more complex adaptive environment. And therefore we need to uh, go away from this uh, classic structure and go to a self-organizing distributed uh, uh, system. And uh, that's what I will talk about. Uh, if you look at a university today, it uh, revolves around three pillars. There's an education pillar, which is mostly about bachelor research, uh, bachelor education and master programs. There are also other alternatives, but they are smaller. Uh, the same is uh, so for research, which is mostly about producing PhDs, but of course you have the permanent staff uh, that needs to be able to do that, and there are other smaller uh, research activities, but the main thing are PhDs. And the same is true for public services, where uh, it's mostly about spin-offs, but again, there are alternatives like uh, auditing and uh, uh, providing uh, expertise, uh, consulting. So those alternatives uh, exist as well. Uh, but I'm just trying to show that those three pillars are the focus. Uh, when I'm going to talk about interversity, I'm actually considering two different uh, things. Uh, the open university and the integrated uh, interversity. The open university is going to be the foundation, the basic, the most natural thing that comes, and that's the, uh, the, the part I'm going to explain most about during this uh, presentation. The integrated university is to show what may be possible, so that's uh, an extension on it. Um, both have a different relation to the three pillars and to what is being innovated. In the open interversity, the, uh, the relation to the three pillars uh, uh, is about becoming massive. So what you have is that university, uh, most of its uh, the things it do does, it's still uh, only for the happy few. Uh, the happy few in society go to university, but the happy few in university uh, make a PhD and the happy few PhDs create a spin-off. So it's always like the top of the top of the top, let's say, okay? So one of the things you, you see is that there's a shift happening uh, where this is uh, uh, becoming more <coughs> massive. And uh, for education, the trend is really breaking through at the moment, uh, which the term MOOC stands for Massive Open, uh, no, Massive Online Open Courses, I always switch the two. And um, so, but it's basically, it's. I'll try to argue that it's, um, we can do a lot more. Uh, innovation uh, relates to the trend of uh, innovation being something that is internal to innovation that is open. Now, I'm not just thinking about open innovation that really talks about this idea that uh, uh, organizations have to, uh, cannot really uh, contain the, their, their uh, innovation, uh, but I'm also thinking about open source development, uh, Open, um, open governance. There are many openness things happening now. So openness is, a, is clearly a trend that uh, you see all around and that of course relates to the complex adaptive change we see. Now the integrated interversity is going to be different. Uh, where there I'm going to show that the, the three pillars are today basically competing, competing for uh, intelligence, competing for bright minds. Uh, where you see that professors who like to teach 
complain about the research and professors who like to research complain about the teaching so and like if you go to medicine uh, there is more public service happening already and you see that they well then have problems with the teaching and the and the, and the research so um, the, the what I'm going to try to show is that this competition can actually uh, transform to a synergy if you focus on architectural innovation so what is architectural innovation uh, consider how a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. What happens is that the caterpillar cocoons itself, and you see that internally the resources stay the same, but all the connections change. And what happens and what comes out of it is something totally different. So that's a clear uh, architectural innovation. Of course, it also exists with organizations that uh, have to reinvent themselves. In this case, I'm going to argue about how universities are capable of doing an architectural innovation and transform the competitive uh, situation of the three pillars now into a synergetic relation. And it requires this concept of interversity, of understanding how everything is connected and how that actually can become something positive. The innovation I'm going to talk to, uh, about in the integrated interversity is a difference between a push, push innovation and a pull innovation. So what I mean with a push uh, innovation is that you have research growing naturally and then they decided like, yeah, this can be useful for an application over there, so let's make a spin-off. Uh, what I mean with pool uh, innovation is there is a big problem in society and you need to solve that. And we don't really know how, so you need to pull it out. And it's, it's, a, it's a change from, uh, from having it naturally evolving to actually start managing it. And that's the focus I want to go to. Uh, what I'm uh, uh, mostly interested in is showing how an integrated university allows you to manage radical innovations. And I'll later on explain what, ra well, la radical innovations, what you see is that an innovation is only possible by an organization. Inventions are possible by individuals. Innovation is only possible by an organization. And radical innovations is only possible by an ecosystem. And I'll gonna show examples on that later on. Um, so the basic principle is we need to work with complexity. Now the principle is simple, the execution, that's something different. And that's what I'm going to try and show by going back to how it was like. Classrooms in the Victorian period, here you see uh, one of them. Uh, you see it's about small children, uh, well-disciplined, and need to listen very clearly. And the whole idea is that they need to absorb a certain amount of knowledge so that they can... Uh, can uh, uh, have those skills. Now today knowledge is not really the skill you need to have. What you see is the classrooms in 2010 look, uh, well there are still some similarities, but uh, it's failing. And also look at the age. The age now it's more related to higher education is a very important uh, uh, issue. Uh, but you see over here a clear example where, where they just don't seem to care. The question is, is this the kid's fault? And I'm I'm uh, inclined to say that that's a very easy way to, um, to uh, push away responsibility. If you say that it's the kid's fault, then it's not your responsibility. Um, well, what I think is that the, the everything has changed in so much that what we used to do doesn't work anymore. And so it's basically all of our responsibility to, to change the system so that, we, that it would work. And what does it mean then, work, right? Okay, let's uh, look at the second pillar, research. If I go back, I, I guess it's, it's around 1880, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but this is a classical example of a laboratory around uh, uh, that period, and what you see is a big room with all kind of strange artifacts and a single, probably rich um, uh, person playing around with it. That's a classical, uh, the early laboratories, um, what you see. Few people, a lot of strange things. If you go today, this is a picture of a code sprint. Um, so a code sprint is, uh, in this case, you see a lot of people sitting in uh, small groups and they are actually producing work. This is not just uh, a cafe, uh, people having a drink and a laugh. No, this is work, this is research. And what you see there is that the, the research has changed uh, very um, uh, big. It's, it's, it's become a lot more social. It's a lot more about co intelligence, about uh, peers, about uh, getting information from each other. Um, you see that the technology has become more ambient, mostly by ITs. It's, it's becoming small, simple devices, uh, clean, lean, uh, but with a lot of power and a lot of abilities. 
Uh, if you look around in, to those tables, you see that uh, there are a lot of computers, smartphones, but there is also drinks, there is also food if you look uh, good enough, a lot of paper to, to write on. So what you see is workspaces, small workspaces where people are able to create connections. And that's basically um, the, the, the work, uh, the laboratories we see today more. Uh, the social has been a big, uh, become a big uh, component. Now, if I want to go to the public service, the third pillar, it's a little bit um, impossible to, to uh, see before and after because it's a pretty new concept. Uh, it's basically emerged in the 1990s, uh, but that's the second kind of uh, what is called technology transfer offices. So it's also a little bit hard to give you any picture of because I'm just showing you the room where several spin-offs uh, are located. That's this one is uh, the technology transfer here at this university. Um, where, uh, so basically the, the, the research labs can act, uh, rent a room here for their startup, right? And all startups are close together. But the, the more important thing is that you need to uh, create an organization. You need to create connections to society. It's a, of course, how do you put that in a picture? Um, so it's pretty recent trend. Uh, I'm going to try to argue that uh, it's uh, going to be probably the most important trend uh, later on. So first, open university. Um, well, I like to say it's part of the geek revolution now. Uh, I can give another presentation on what the geek revolution is, uh, but just uh, to keep it short, think about uh, the internet blackout day, uh, the Arabic spring, uh, the occupation movement, the whole fuzz around uh, WikiLeaks. You see there are things happening there. And the picture I'm showing here is basically, uh, it's a symbol of the, of the movement. It's, uh, it's related to a movie called uh, V from Vendetta, but, it's, uh, but it has to do with uh, anonymity and the ability to, to fight giants, basically fight uh, uh, bad forces. And it has become... Uh, uh, if you look today to the news uh, and you see some kind of gathering, there's a big chance you see uh, this, uh, uh, this mask. Now, it's also in negative things, right? Think about the parties where uninvited people suddenly with masses come and, uh, and start rioting. That's, that's, it can also be negative, so that's what you have with revolutions. So it's part of that trend, right? But I like to focus on technology and uh, argue that uh, technology uh, shows a guided emergence. Now, um, in this case, uh, I want to emphasize that technology can be an eye-opener. Now it's just uh, silliness. I was just thinking earlier on the train that this is probably a picture from uh, Clockwork Orange. I think so. Yeah. 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 Uh, which then suddenly gives a whole different interpretation on that <laughs> picture, but okay. <laughs> Uh, but the thing I want to say is, okay, this is just a silliness, but uh, to emphasize the technology aspect. So let's get a little bit more serious about it. But before I can go serious, uh, I, there are things you need to know. Stigmergy. Everyone needs to know what stigmergy is, so I'll quickly go over it. Um, it's the idea that a sign uh, puts you into action. What you see is that that already uh, happens with uh, um, insects and other what is called social creatures. Uh, there are also um, other... Uh, uh, there are even mammals uh, who are earth social, but um, I'm not going to get into that. The, the whole principle you see on the, what is it, uh, the right side, uh, which is uh, how uh, a solitary wasp constructs its nest. And you see that there is a sign and then there is a some part of development, right? And in this case, there are like five of these stages. And what they do is that at a certain moment is at uh, stage four, uh, they have mimicked stage one and you see that the wasp is actually uh, starting over again. So that's what you see in the, in the second line. You see, that's the way you can actually clearly show how the stigma G is working, while it's really the sign putting things in motion. And the question is, of course, then if, if, if ants can do this, what can we do with, with a lot more intelligence? Because we also build on top of what other people build. And to uh, become a bit more practical with it, I want to show this case, uh, which is uh, from it's a presentation given two years ago, I guess, here, uh, about stigmergic prototyping in uh, industrial design school. And I, I want to show this picture because it shows how stigmergy allows spreading activation in a real setting. What you see here is uh, a disabled person uh, <laughs> who has troubles uh, uh, making a fist and uh, therefore can't eat ice cream anymore. 
and so they created this small ring to with a with a with a uh, to to put the ice cream in, right? Uh, that's the Stigbergic prototype. But what you see is that there is a whole kind of other agents around. It. There is, uh, okay, the disabled person is the user. There are the industrial designers who are the developers. But there is also the caretaker and the therapist who are basically representatives in the network. So you can see a network of agents and artifacts and, and relations between them. And you see that if a change happens in one, like if the designer thinks of something and shares it with the people around them, you see this spreading activation of the development. And that can be stigmergic. And what I'm going to argue about is that this, uh, this prototype is basically a catalyst that triggers this uh, interaction and changes this network of related people, which is basically a medium, into uh, uh, something that mediates. In this case, the ability, uh, the uh, overcoming the disability. And, but it's always situated, and that's an important part. In this case, it's a very concrete problem. I'm going to show you some other cases where it's more virtual. And the cases I'm showing are cases based uh, uh, of student projects uh, created in my courses. I'll come back to that course in, in later on, but I'm going to show you some examples uh, during the presentation. So in this case, it's, uh, uh, I want to show that the artifacts and the relations can be a lot more virtual. Uh, it's a, 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 a site for uh, creating trips. So what you do, you see, okay, it's a bad picture because I just uh, took it during his exam. Um, but you can actually click on the map, uh, like uh, on cities, and thereby add it to uh, a virtual trip you are making. So you're creating a, a page, a trip. And what the system then does is um, uh, using the traveling salesman algorithm to uh, calculate the shortest path between all the cities. Uh, so it shows you how the interaction between the, 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 the people using it and the, the artifacts you create kind of triggers uh, the, the activation. Um, the two cases are actually always situated. The one is about trips, things you really want to do. Therefore, I want to focus uh, on blended reality, uh, where the real and your IT actually um, uh, extends uh, what you already used to do. Like in this case, it's about real estate, and so the whole idea is that you can take a picture of a building, and uh, if it's on sale, you directly can see uh, how much uh, they are asking, get all kind of uh, related information on it. And and that's a little bit the a trend I see with many of the projects. Uh, if you have a medium being the internet, and you can have a catalyst being an IT device. You can actually uh, take on the situation in a very different uh, uh, way. In this case, uh, it's a blended reality on books. So what you do here is uh, use the ESBN service you have with Google Books and Amazon and some other thing, uh, online systems. And uh, at the meantime, you use a smartphone like this. And you take pictures of the books you have in your, uh, um, in your library. And by making uh, your whole library digital, and then using these online services, you can actually get a better insight of what other books would very much relate to the library you already have, not just to the things you have bought at that shop, but actually to your actual physical library. Um, so that's another project actually developed by several students. Uh, but the trend is the same. It's always <coughs> medium, internet, catalyst, <coughs> IT device, yes, and situated. <coughs> what do you do with the books? Do you not do it with... Uh, Visiting cards of people. I you can do this with all kinds of things. I have thousands of cards from all my yeah. meetings yeah. worldwide. And wherever I go, not only I would like to select immediately all the people I know in that location, mm -hmm. then I would like to select them who have the uh, capabilities what I'm looking for at that moment for that project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, for example, you, you know, you've got LinkedIn and other uh, social sites. You can even connect it over there and start uh, searching the sites for information. You can connect all kinds of things. It's, it's what, I, what is called uh, integrating um, uh, APIs. A API yeah. stands for Application Programming Interface. Yeah. There is a small app on this machine that allows you to uh, recognize uh, pictures. There is a, 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 an API on uh, LinkedIn to, to find information, and you, you can, and what you kind of do is like a DJ, you connect the things. We call it mashups. So you create mashups between all the uh, already existing applications and con connect them. 
Um, I like to emphasize a little bit more about the situations. Like you said, physics cards is, would be another example. This is another example, again, from one of my students, um, who had a device with him to uh, scan my brain um, and find my brain waves, which, so it's an EEG device. And I plugged it on my head, and then this is basically what came out of it. I guess that, or I was dead, uh, or probably it wasn't well connected at the moment that I took the picture. Is it negative, uh, hmm? is that negative if, if I understand? Is it negative? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were wondering what it was doing. But here it says heartbeat, not Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah but, but here, is, that's a positive then, okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, but the, the idea here is, okay, so it's to show it's not only smartphones. There are actually an unlimited amount of uh, connections you can create if you, if you take in that situation that as, uh, a lot more uh, seriously. Um, in this case, the, the whole idea revolves around a, a concrete problem about healthcare where you have remote places uh, where like uh, 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 patients need to do uh, regular uh, checkups, right? For us, that's not a problem. It takes uh, 20 minutes to get to a hospital, but there are places where it takes you three, four hours to get into the hospital. So that means you're losing a whole day for, uh, for a regular checkup. And what you do with those systems is you actually apply the, 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 the routine activities on yourself and you send the data to uh, the doctors. So this would be the interface for the doctors. He would look at it, or she would look at it, uh, and uh, consider, okay, this is, this is default, this is what I expect, and then you don't need to come in. Well, if there would be a problem, you have to come in, or maybe you didn't connect it well, didn't do it well, you still need to come in. But you reduce the amount of useless uh, travels to a hospital. Um, it's another case. Um, I specifically want to give it, uh, well, let's ask. How many of you are at the moment in uh, ha emitting alpha waves? Well, you don't know? Delta waves, come on. Who is alpha or beta? Wh which, which, in which one are you at the moment? In all of them. Yeah, you're always in all of them. But, but, but when, which one are you emitting the most? But you're in alpha? <laughs> See, the, the thing is, basically, we don't really know. Well, if I ask you which color of uh, um, well, shirt I have. Uh, probably everyone can answer that. Well, we can probably even still debate about that, but okay. Um, the thing I want to say is that uh, you can actually uh, change what by technology uh, uh, the sensors you're having to the sensors you're better able to work with. And this is uh, happening in uh, uh, therapeutic uh, movement of ADHD and epilepsy. In this case, it's ADHD because the guy needs to play a pretty uh, aggressive game, I guess. I don't think they would do that with epilepsy patients. Uh, so what, what you do is you, you transform it. Uh, you use a technology to transform your, your stimuli. That's another case where, again, situated artifacts um, are, uh, are mediating. This is uh, uh, one of the uh, projects where, where it is used in a very different way, where you see that uh, data uh, is uh, changed by uh, Venn diagram statistics and so on. Uh, but it's basically a little bit, I, want, I wanted to give this before it because it's basically a little bit the same. What you do is if you see tables of data and I say what's wrong with it, you would say like, I don't know. But if I, if I transform it into Venn diagrams and statistical nice pictures, you may actually easily say what's wrong with it. You can, you can better uh, uh, approach it. And that's basically the, the thing I want to go to is that uh, we may be used to doing things in a certain way, but don't fully understand that by enrichment we can actually get things done in a different way, in a lot more effi efficient way. Um, a last example uh, about uh, a very different um, device. In this case, it's uh, someone who became blind, used this technology, uh, sensors on the tongue, to see via the camera. And then after, they say that after 50 minutes, uh, someone who became blind can actually catch a ball. So it's pretty efficient. Uh, and you see it there, it's again a, a case of the brain plasticity. Uh, so it, this is just another, uh, uh, to, to show you that there are many possible uh, devices you can create. And to not create the wrong picture that it's only about um, 
about disabilities and very uh, niche, narrow things. I want to go to other cases, uh, specifically big market cases, like in this case, fashion industry. Um, guess this is a publicity for uh, the item that's uh, of our eye thingy. What is it of Google? I guess. Not sure. Google glasses. Google, Google glasses? No. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm not sure. It's uh, found it online, of course. Um, but what I want to focus on are the project, of course. The project uh, uh, we have done. And this one is basically done by one of my uh, students interested in, in, uh, in uh, aesthetics. And she, wants, she finds that concept of uh, virtual artifacts very appealing and want to put it on steroids, basically, by using Google Earth. So with Google Earth, you can actually build any kind of 3D thing in reality. If you want to uh, reconstruct your house, that's uh, a tool, uh, a, a good place to do it. But you can then also share it. <coughs> and here the whole idea is that if I, for example, have a, 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 sh uh, a closet I really like, I could actually put the effort to, to digitalize it and to I show it and share it with people. But then it's actually in a database and other people can just play around with it. And I can, for example, see how this can lead to a spin-off uh, where, you, where you have uh, um, people in the um, fashion industry starting building all these artifacts for the things they want to put in the market and then put this on this virtual uh, platform to see how people play with it and understand the stigmergic, stigmergic actions that uh, will come from it. And that's basically what I'm going to show with this last one, because this one, okay, it's a little bit hard to visualize it, and uh, the, the whole 3D things uh, didn't really uh, finish, so uh, it's hard to visualize. This is another case. Uh, it's called online wardrobe. You simply take pictures of uh, your clothes, you tag them saying, like, this is a, a blues, this is a shirt, uh, shoes, and so on, and then you put them in the system. Uh, uh, so you see the wardrobe, in this case, of Jasmine. But what you can do by that, by tagging it, is actually um, playing this uh, game where you say, I want to combine, combine those shoes with uh, those trousers and so on, right? And I can, for example, imagine that, uh, that once you do that, you can actually save it and said like, I think this is a good combination to wear. And there would be, like, I'm, I'm definitely thinking about uh, uh, girls that would be very uh, interested in playing with it. I mean, I know that several of my, uh, my uh, students were playing with it and wanting to have it basically so, such a system. But again, the garment <coughs> industry can play on this and, and uh, launch uh, their own things. So the, the essence I'm getting out of here is that you build a free platform and you harvest the stigmatic relations. So all of these cases, the last case, I'm not going to get into too deep, but you know Google uh, ha has been uh, running around with, with these cars to map everything. And they also uh, are investing a lot in uh, driverless cars. So another big market would be uh, transportation, where they actually uh, could, uh, so today you can actually map, uh, if you want to go from one place to another, you can use uh, maps to, to do that. The next phase would be that you say, oh, and by the way, send me a car. That's, that's the, 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 what they call uh, Google Maps on steroids. That's one of the things they, they were aiming for. I mean, I can imagine many other uh, possibilities you, you could uh, do there to get on. But I want to get back to the university and the three pillars. So why all those cases? What, what you see with all those cases is those are student projects. But at the same time, the students, by creating a project, have been developing uh, also creating knowledge. They just they don't only have been um, creating skills, which is basically what they had to do in the education part. But instead of focusing on existing knowledge, what I've been working on is to see how I can uh, uh, put them uh, in a complex adaptive environment where the, the existing information is just a tool to, to do something. It's, you don't have to know it all. You need to, wait, you, need to, you need to find ways to find it more than to know it. That's a little bit the, the trend. And it focused to project-oriented uh, education, where you see that the, if you go project-oriented, you don't only have the education part, you also have the, the research part in the sense that you are creating knowledge, and you also have public service part in the sense that you're creating these micro spin-offs. And so this is a, a, a simple case. Uh, how you see that the, there is a synergetic relation between this education, research, and uh, public service by taking a different way. Now, if you want to do a project-oriented education, 
um, the, you need to start uh, putting a lot more uh, emphasis on guiding students. Like the case you saw earlier with the Stigmergic prototype, what you see is that it, there's, a, there's the, the user, so the disabled person, there, there are two design students, there is a caretaker, there is a teacher, there's a lot of people involved. And all of them are actually helping to develop the thing. So uh, that's what you need, you need to uh, properly guide the emerging. And uh, it, it makes all the difference, but it's also extremely expensive. And uh, that's why a lot of people would say, okay, that's, that's, that, that's all very nice, but it's not realistic. I mean, you cannot, you cannot for every student have a teacher. That's not really realistic. So um, what I'm getting to is, yeah, let's start using self-organization and distributed uh, uh, development a lot more. Like, uh, look at the self-regulation by games. Uh, you see how they can bring kids into a state of flow and learn a lot. So how do you use that uh, part? You see self-regulation by peers. This is a case of um, uh, in uh, slops in India, where people, uh, where the students, well, well basically this is, um, the, the kids don't have any education. And uh, what they do here is uh, they, they just build a screen in the wall connected to the internet and then leave. And kids start using it and start learning themselves how to use it. Because basically they don't have anything else to do. They, they are there without any uh, uh, prospect. So they start uh, self-educating. And in this case, you, you really see that peer learning is a very important uh, aspect. So creating an experiment about scalable education uh, to, to solve the problem of the tutoring. And uh, I'm going to explain that it takes uh, collective intelligence to a new height. I had, um, I don't know how many students I actually had, but in the end there were 300 active. There were 330 active where 30 of them left after several weeks. Uh, they, 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 well, for the first semester they continued in the second semester, and, uh, but they figured out that they couldn't reach it. Uh, but 300 students were really active in this project. And the first thing I did is a kind of score gamification. What I mean with it is that feedback is often coming very late. So one of the things you can start doing is make sure that uh, you get feedback a lot sooner. In this case, um, students uh, could actually evaluate other students, and that would directly generate a score, an indicating score to them, like where they are. And that's what you see in this case. Uh, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you see on the right upper corner, you see model sensitivity and an MC, which stands for Monte Carlo simulations. That were three things they had to do. And each of them could uh, give them a score. And they could decide if they want to go deep in one module or do from all three of them uh, the basics. And that's basically one of the things you see there. They had to do tasks. Tasks were issues. So a whole project exists of several issues. And um, they could like do one model, one sensitive, and one Monte Carlo all basic, or they could do one model advanced. That was pretty open. And you see sometimes there's a star, sometimes there's a circle. That means that, um, like, here's a star, here's a circle. That means that it was um, uh, evaluated by students, but not yet uh, um, checked by the teacher. So you have an indicating uh, score and not the UN score. That's some of the things that uh, showed up. The other thing is that, um, so creating your project, creating issues is one part, but you can actually learn a lot from each other. Uh, and therefore, I focus a lot on evaluation. Basically, I've noticed that uh, there are three levels of learning. Uh, you learn uh, from uh, passive. You, you take it up. You say, OK, I understand, right? <laughs> Uh, you, you, you have the active version of learning. You can actually reproduce it during an exam, for example. Sometimes you understand it, and then you need to do an exam, and then you're not able to do it. So there, there's a, a boundary. And then the third one, and that's again only uh, available for the happy few, that's when you teach. Because once you are teaching, you're getting so challenged about uh, all the possibly diversity you have around that topic, uh, that you truly uh, get deep on your on the topic, uh, and and what you do is by putting the evaluation also part of the education. It's actually you learn actually more. Um, this this table is a little bit more complicated because students had uh, x amount of issues uh, evaluation they had to do, and then there was a difference between how many they did. Like if they did more, 
then the score would be higher than the average. But if they would do less, then the score would be lower. So there was a whole mechanism. Uh, but basically, I can, I can, if, if anyone wants, I can go to the details of the mathematical formulas later. But it was uh, created in such a way that it would be automated automatically. So I never really gave a score. I just said, uh, if, is it basic, is it good, and so on. Uh, the other part is a, what I like to call a stigmergic decomposition. What you do is like, okay, so there's projects, but I don't look at a project. Students can work together or alone. I didn't care. I looked at what students did. And even in a group, you, you have a task to do. So if you just look at the issue, you can actually always uh, 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 relate it back to an individual. So I decomposed it in issues. And then you see that issues can have several stigmas, right? Like one of them is the level, normal or basic. Another one is over here is the status. Like it was just active, so the student was still working on. You can have a look at it and see what it is about, but let the student do. But then at a certain moment, uh, when they upload their, their issue, uh, there, it needs review. And then the other students can have a look at it and start evaluating. And at, at a certain moment, there, there really needs to be a closure. And that's this part, uh, where, when it gets green, when it gets evaluated by peers, or when it gets evaluated by, uh, by teachers. So there was two alternatives. Oh, down here. This part is a, a, a table of evaluation. So there was one issue called financing higher education in Nigeria. That was a project uh, this person was working on. And you see there are two evaluations. Now, the problem is if a student creates an evaluation, you're not sure if that's good. So you need a meta-evaluation. That's the second part. And uh, what you see here is that this is a, was rated as, a, a, as the issue was good. This was rated that the issue was normal. Um, average, right? Uh, and then you see that the meta evaluation says that this person actually doesn't really, wasn't very good. This evaluation wasn't very good, while this evaluation was a lot better, was good. It, it actually uh, changes the way that those values translate into uh, points. Like, the, well, very simple rule. If there was one meta evaluation, then it wouldn't count at all because it was bad, right? Create a bad evaluation, we don't care what, you, what kind of scores you set. And then for every star, this would be uh, counted once. So it would be a weighted average. So in this case, it would be uh, four stars once, and then uh, you take uh, away this one, and so that's three times three stars. So it's closer to three stars and four stars. That's a, that's a whole the way the system worked. Um, but the thing is that, um, of course, the, scale, the scalability, uh, where I wanted to work on all of this is actually the preconditions. It's not yet scalable. The whole idea of the scalability is that 80% uh, of the tasks are actually very default and could have been done by the students, while 20% of the tasks are not, and that's where you need to put 80% of your task in, of your effort in. And uh, to, to, to do that, actually there is a third thing that needs to be taken into account. First, the whole system is empty means that only your most autodidact students start uh, acting. They create issues. You start creating, as a teacher, creating evaluations of. So that starts generating the, 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 the code. The second part is that because they, once they create an issue, they need to start doing evaluations. The first uh, most autodidact students will treat the, less, the little less autodidact but still pretty autonomous students uh, to start acting. And they will start doing issues, uh, evaluations on their issues. So that's kind of a, a cascade that's happening, right? Um, but what happens is that I actually shift from evaluating issues by creating evaluations to evaluating evaluations by creating meta-evaluations. And then in that scenario, I actually can recognize students who are doing very well in evaluations. And then I, I say, I, I mail them, I let them know, like, you're doing very well in evaluations, you can become one of my uh, student assistants. And that's what, what you see over here. I ended up with 60 students who were my assistants. And like uh, F. Garcia was the, the, the person most active. I, in the end, did 41 uh, evo uh, meta evaluations. So that's evaluating the evaluations, right? After all the evaluations. And so what, what you see is that I shift from the, the project, from the issues, to the evaluations, to actually people. And uh, it, uh, it's not just about having the system working, so showing how the self-organization can solve many of the uh, problems, 
but also about how to start up such a system. So and that's basically where I'm, I met with, the, uh, with the, the experiments showing that you can actually go to this scalability uh, by taking collective intelligence a little bit more serious. What I want to show now is uh, how that actually fits in a more theoretical uh, uh, phase and how we actually can, uh, if we understand the dynamics well enough, can use that for an integrated university. That's going to be a little bit more complicated. Back on. Uh, I showed that uh, with all the projects, there's always a concept to start from. I mean, I can even show that with, uh, like if you go to the whole evolution of electricity, you, I can show this, this, this trend where uh, few people uh, uh, understood the concept and could work with it, mostly very scientifically. You see that then it shifts more to engineering part where uh, several developers uh, were working in group to create the, 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 the prototype, which is very fragile technology, basically. And what you see then is that the prototype transforms into a product. The product, uh, the difference between the prototype and the product is that you have an organization encapsulating the artifact and like protecting it legally and making sure that there is continuity. Like you get paid to work for Google, right? So that means that the, the technology of Google is basically more um, in, uh, um, robust. That's when you get when you get the product. A product is always about organization. Uh, in the next phase, then it becomes massive. It becomes more open again. And you see several organizations, several individuals connecting and interacting. Uh, what you see there is that the, the interactions start coordinating. So between all the things that happen on those platforms, you see coordination arriving. The last phase is that uh, when, you, when you shift from uh, the, the natural self-organizing coordination to control. And that's when you need to start institutionalizing and, and building uh, enterprises to ensure that what you want actually is, is, is already embodied by the structure around it. And in this whole thing, there are actually three dynamics uh, happening. Uh, to create this from concept to prototype and from product to framework, there is this bootstrapping cascade that we'll explain right away. Uh, on one hand, it is uh, converging. On the other hand, it's diverging. I'll show you right away how that works. Then there is a spreading activation. And then there is the mobilizing institute. I'll talk about those three dynamics now. First, the bootstrapping cascade. I'll show you that um, what, what happens is you, you start with current skills and there is a challenge and you need to bridge that gap. Um, so you have concepts, you have ideas, but they are not very, situ they may be uh, situated in the, in the challenge, but they may not be situated in your skills. So what you need to do is you need to close the gap and get to the guided prototype. How does that work? Well, your skills you train. If you know that you need mathematics for, for doing that, you begin with mathematics one, mathematics two, mathematics three. Those are scaffolds. What do you mean by scaffold? A scaffold is, uh, scaffold is uh, in, in Dutch, it's uh, a an, stelling. An so a scaffold, and what they call in, in uh, cognitive uh, science, uh, instructional scaffolds, are, are support structures, right? I could have called it support structure, but because they, they always use instructional scaffolds, and I think that scaffold is a good thing because the scaffold, you, you can see how it helps development. And for the, the client, it's a temporal structure, while for the developer, it's a permanent structure. And that's the same for a teacher. Uh, for a student, doing mathematics one, two, and three is temporal. You go through it, and after it, you don't need to go through it anymore. But for the teacher, it's always uh, continuous. There, for him, it's tools. For the others, it's part of development. So you train, right? The other thing that's a little bit harder to understand is what I like to call penetration. What happens is, uh, think about market penetration. Think about uh, if Pasteur wanted to understand uh, yeast, he had to actually get tele uh, a microscope to, to penetrate that, that micro world. So he needs tools to penetrate. If it's marketing tools or, or uh, physical tools, tools. Tools help you penetrate until you get uh, close the gap. I'm going to be concrete with uh, all the projects you've seen uh, before. The whole idea were there were business students. That's what I got. And the focus was internet innovation. There's a diversity on projects, but all of them follow the same trend. What happens is that I needed to train these business students in programming. That's basically 
So that's what I had to do, teach them programming, and I encapsulated by, by this uh, internet innovation. And so the first thing they learn is like what is called treaty architecture, learn what uh, databases are, how, how you create some basic code, and so on. And, uh, and then the second phase of learning, they need to start really co uh, programming more in interestingly, what is called uh, software design. So the first <laughs> exercises they refactored to understand the architectures of software. So that's, that's the second one. And then the last one I did is a Drupal module, it's, which is a content management system, but at the same time also a development framework. And that allowed to connect with what is happening on the, on the other side, on the penetration part. What happens on the penetration part, the first thing they have to do is blogging. Because if you have a good idea that can be something, but trying to write down what it is about, that's a very different uh, challenge. It's already a very good first challenge. Try to express what you are doing in, in words and write it down, and the other students will interact on it, and I will interact on it. So we, we can see uh, if, that, if, if we can give you feedback on that idea. The second thing they had to do is I earlier said that there were something like API stands for Application Programming Interface. Many current online applications have these APIs. And what you, what you see is that once you have blocked about your ID, you can actually start exploring, like, how can I support my ID with existing APIs and, and, uh, for later integration? And that's why I needed to have them develop Drupal models, because then they would integrate those APIs into Drupal models and create those micro spin-offs I uh, showed earlier. OK, so that's the same trend, and I can actually show that that is uh, applicable to many kind of educations, as long as there is a skills and challenge bridge you need to uh, overlap. Uh, the other part, the diverging, going from the product to the framework, it's different. Okay, I start with an existing course, um, being about risk management. And I had to find a way to scale uh, the, the thing because I would be the only teacher left. So then you see that I need to, uh, so you need to get an externally oriented penetration and externally oriented training, I'll, I'll explain. Uh, the first thing I did was like the, the passive videos. Everything I did in, in a class normally, like you're sitting and I'm saying we are recording this right now, that's a passive video. You could just do, watch the video. So once I've skipped that and you don't need to do that anymore, what's, what's next? Okay, next thing is the content regulation. You see that online they need to interact and coordinate and so on. And that worked pretty well, but there was a lot of uh, things happening there, like evaluations and issues, but unstructured. So that's the last thing I then did, is then uh, make sure that that would be more structured and uh, shift from, from sorry, um, so the, the last thing I actually did was then uh, shift uh, to coordinating students. You, you, you go from coordinating the content on the site Right, saying that's a good issue, that's a good evaluation by doing evaluation and meta evaluation. You go eventually to coordinating students. Uh, I know that there was one month uh, I had something like 150 mails a day, because if, if, if 60 students start mailing you five, seven mails a day, that starts uh, counting up. But that's basically what you see. You start <coughs> coordinating people, and on the other hand, you had the basic uh, uh, course site first, uh, then you had the the the, the separations of issues uh, and, and the more uh, and so uh, the, the, the more structured parts of right. So you had a basic site where they could interact. I have understood that in that interaction there were uh, unstructured things they were doing, like evaluations. And I used then the issue queue to make sure that they could do that on a more structured way, right? And then what what in the end happens is what I like to call spillover interfaces is that, uh, for example, there was a conflict with one of my best uh, evaluators and a student, where the evaluator was claiming that that student is always treating the system uh, being the second evaluator, uh, and therefore uh, not taking any risk. But of course, I didn't know any of the situation, uh, so I had to investigate, and I created all kinds of social networking analysis on my data to figure out if that student was really trying to trick the system. And it turned out it wasn't, so I had to uh, to, to solve the problem, but at the same time, because of the, the, the analysis uh, things I did on the database, I just encapsulated into an interface, and I sent a mail to all my uh, student <coughs> assistants, saying that if you are in doubt of if the student is playing well or not, uh, have a look at that interface, and that's basically this interface, where, where you can see if they're 
how often is the uh, first time, the second time, and so on. How often do they create basic, normal, advanced? How often is it poor? And so, so you get more overview of, of all the data. So that was one of the interfaces later on created specifically for uh, the, the student assistance. So that's what I would call with the spillover interfaces. You, there are conflicts, and the conflicts are opportunities to learn how to uh, transform them. So that's a case of a product changing it into a framework, in this case, of course, into a, a distributed and self-organizing course. And the, the thing between it is spreading activation. Um, like I said, uh, radical innovation always happens in the ecosystem. Um, well, what I did to, to understand that in a lot more detail uh, is participate in a very specific ecosystem where, um, where there's a very clear balance between community interest and business interest. And between 2005 and 2010, uh, there were something like uh, 20 startups in that ecosystem. And they, they developed, uh, mostly with venture capital. So that's, again, one of the things I want to show here. You have seed rounds, which is basically uh, people investing because they believe in you. That's a different reason than the most part, where it's basically about uh, ally creating alliances where the, your partner is actually having an interest in your development. And that's the more central part, where you see that there are venture capital rounds where there's getting money into the system and creating this cloud of prototypes, transform them in an ecosystem of products carried by organizations. And I've noticed that um, those organizations were uh, doing open innovation. So in 2010, I start interviewing all of those startups to figure out why do they do open innovation. And what I figured out is that they didn't even know what open innovation was. <laughs> that was fun. Um, and notice that while there was technology development happening, under the surface, there was organizational development happening. And from a very pragmatic point, they start what is, uh, using the prototypes and the frameworks that existed for the developers to actually solve their problems. Like, uh, uh, there was a scarcity on skills. So they would get a client asking them to develop this and this and this but they may not have the skills to develop them. So they say, of course, to the client, yes, we will do that. Otherwise, they don't have any clients. Um, and then they start looking at ways to solve their, uh, their, uh, their, their scarcity problem. So what they then do is they use the system that existed where you can actually track who has been developing a lot around a certain module and then contact that person who often, because they are good developers, would be working for another organization and that way you would actually uh, start work collaborating with that other organization. And you see this spreading activation, like the, the small spreading activation I showed earlier with the thing merging prototype. In this system actually was, was way more present. And the technology was way more mediating it. And so what you see is this, this, this wave becoming bigger uh, of this organizational development uh, bootstrapped um, uh, from those prototypes and existing frameworks. And then, because the, the, the ecosystem basically uh, went into a, a growth phase, so this is a, a prematurity phase, there was a difference where, uh, where, where you see that that wave starts looking like a standing wave, but uh, I don't want to go too much into detail about that. Um, basically, what you can see is that uh, you can resonate uh, a community out of another existing community. Uh, by tapping into what that community is already using to, en uh, to enrich. In this case, it's, uh, the development is being enriched by those frameworks and prototypes, and then you see that the organizations are tapping into it to, to leverage their own uh, abilities. And um, that's how I want to finish up with the uh, concept for the integrated university, where uh, you use those different mechanisms uh, in an uh, enterprise architecture, where you have the spreading activation uh, as the base, so you need those frameworks, you need those interactions, you need yeah, that, those venturing, all those things happening. Uh, on top of that, you need those uh, bootstrapping cascades education, and what, it, what it's triggering is what, uh, what I like to call circulating references, because all of this is creating data. But if you are working on a very specific uh, social problem, that data is actually relevant for your research. So, and that's uh, uh, what you see very often is that uh, researchers in the humanities uh, have problems getting the data to do their research. 
Well, if you at the start say like this is a problem we're going to tackle as a whole system, and you actually start supporting an existing ecosystem with all the things, then at a certain moment you you will have your data. That's the whole point. So this whole pyramid transforms into um, a process where there's a first iteration, which is around the spreading activation, where you bring all the stakeholders together and you let them interact in an open space, just figuring out who they are. That will actually mostly show you where it's impossible to have an ecosystem, show you where the real big problems are. And that triggers to the second level uh, a challenge triggering the educational challenge for the skills you require. Because you're saying like it's impossible to create an ecosystem for us because we're lacking those skills. And that can start a new uh, part in the, on the educational level where you specifically for those skills create a program. On the same time, this interaction needs to cultivate. The interaction needs to become more and more, start coordinating, become uh, uh, together. While at the same time, you start creating a, a, a whole level of education. And I'm going to show that in the next diagram how the interaction can actually uh, revolve around a certain period. Um, the whole thing is that the, the development, so the idea is that the interversity would be a pipeline, the spin-off ecosystems. So every, every new block, there would be a new one starting. And um, uh, the spinning off of an ecosystem would take six iterations, while each iteration would be one semester. So in this case, the, the, the spinning off of an ecosystem would actually uh, take three years. Right? What, what happens? Um, there's a planning phase in the first iteration. And then the, the next iteration, prematurity, incubation, growth, maturity, and enrichment, those are part of the phase transition uh, happening through the radical innovation. I don't want to get too much into detail about that. Uh, but it's basically, uh, it's individuals with ideas and, uh, starting to connecting to uh, prototypes uh, in, in groups, starting connecting in, in creating organizations, um, uh, creating frameworks, and then spinning it up. That's basically what you want. So in the last phase, the enrichment, it's about institutionalizing whatever has come before it. That's basically the whole principle. On top of that, there can be a master program, uh, a two-year master program, working on this specific uh, uh, topic, where you see that there is a first semester of basic training. And while in the ecosystem, all the people involved are actually, uh, it, 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 it's their concern. So you can pretty sh be sure about their involvement. In case of students, that's not always the case. So after each uh, iteration, there's an exam. If they fail for the basic training, well, they just uh, shift to the next uh, ecosystem in the pipeline, right? And so what happens, basic training, individual project like I showed before, right? In, in my case, it was about internet innovation. There can be any topic. That's what I want to say. If you fix the topic, there can be uh, de defining what kind of individual project will grow. And that's the first year. So after one year, they've demonstrated that they are able to, to, to grasp that. During the second year, they need to start understanding how, what it means to, to collaborate. So it is during this phase that the, the groups, so the students start working in groups, but not just between the students. They actually become part of the ecosystem. And they can work as students between them as a group trying to create a micro spin-off, but they can also start collaborating with the, one of the existing partners in the ecosystem. So that's what, what you see in this phase. And then all the experience, of course, needs to lead to, to the thesis. So the last part, they need to, to wrap it up to actually get a degree, right? You, you, need, uh, you need the thesis. And so that's uh, the, the students. We have the, the, the partners. Now uh, looking to the PhD research. So we're looking at the three pillars, right? Uh, the PhD research, uh, at the first phase, uh, is observing, understanding what the, the whole planning is being. Uh, so there are control agents on top there. And, and there's a control agent uh, uh, responsible for the planning. In this case, it's the last year PhD. And it's a first year PhD that will be at that time observing and just uh, taking everything in. Uh, during the second semester, the PhD student needs to start uh, uh, become responsible for the basic training and still have the, the last year PhD as, as someone to, to get information of, uh, to how that works, right? So there's still a knowledge transfer happening over here. 
Um, the prematurity phase is actually a phase where they just interact the, in the ecosystem. The incubation phase is when they need to start becoming coordination. Because this phase is so important, it has to be the responsibility of the professor. So it's the prof professor that needs to start uh, coordinating the ecosystem. I expect actually that maybe the last year PhD student who actually has helped setting up the first part may become part of the ecosystem. May. It doesn't have to. But it, there, there should be a big uh, chance for it. Um, what happens with the PhD uh, researcher that, that's now already one year uh, working there? He needs to start tutoring the individual projects. Being basically the expert related to the new uh, group of students. During the next phase, what happens here is that there is a, a shift in responsibility where the uh, PhD research is assisting the professor. Now it's basically the professor who is assisting the, the PhD researcher because he's the most experienced with all the projects and all the development to bring the students into the ecosystem. And that's happening in this phase. So the switch happens there. And, and that actually um, translates in the, in the last phase uh, for well, the first three years where the student, uh, the PhD researcher is responsible for the thesis uh, guidance and is consulting for the ecosystem because having experienced all the previous ones. And from that rich experience, the, the PhD student is asked to actually submit um, ideas for next um, ecosystem. And that's being managed on top there by the administration, which is this third pillar, right? The, in part of the third pillar. So what, what happens with the administration is that in the fifth uh, iteration, they need to be responsible to make sure that this enrichment happens and, and the, the ecosystem can be spinned off. So that's a lot of legal stuff, a lot of uh, institutional uh, uh, operational stuff. Uh, but uh, for the, the second semester, they need to do the whole PhD workshops, which, look, this is a university. This is not just one program. Right? In a university, there are many programs. So what I'm expecting is that many of these ecosystems are happening parallel. And also, every year, there, every semester, there's a new one. And what happens over here is that th those PhDs who have been part of this uh, uh, three years are getting, uh, uh, so the, the expertise becomes diverse. Uh, there, there's a di di diversification happening. And it's the administration that needs to create a new selection. Um, creating uh, workshops where the, those different uh, PhDs uh, from different uh, of these spin-offs can interact and coordinate and share knowledge and, and bring up their ideas, but at a certain moment also a selection about which spin-offs uh, will start and which won't. And that's when, they when this becomes the last. So that's the, that's the design of the integrated university. And that's basically all I got. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. It's a beautiful structure, as you said, into the university. Mm -hmm. But you are missing many links in the sense that uh, okay, you need from the beginning already the touch with reality. And that's why in your last key, uh, the bottom line would be would be the real world of yeah. entrepreneurs, of financial groups, of uh -huh. marketing people, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Because if you want that concrete things grow out of your basic explanation, it is wonderful, intra-university-wise, intra university wise, beautiful, but you one day you have to go to the, the real world. But that, that's what's happening, right? That's the, this, this base phase. Yeah, yeah, I understand. This base, yeah. it's, it's basically not what exists today at universities. This is. Uh, all your partners and uh, uh, so today the, the whole uh, part of the public service is very small. There, there is a, a technology transfer office, there are small startups, but it's not really like, the, it's not a framework in society to... There must be a continuous interaction yeah. between the guys from the moment that they have an idea, uh -huh. test it with the real world, may, can it have a chance? until the time that the prototype is ready and that you have to prepare all the things to go into the market with the prototypes. It's one thing. In between, there should be a kind of playground between the real world outside university and the inter-university structure which you explained so well. But with, within the university, I would also make the links with other departments like the business school mm -hmm. and whatever, like 
if you are if you talk about software development, well, at least you have a connection with the engineering hardware people and with the business people. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to make a whole living living life. living uh, society of it. Yeah, where that's the interaction uh, is continuous, and in fact, the connection of the real world with the real world. I mean, I speak about the real world outside the university because I still consider the university still a little bit as the ideal ideal world <laughs> instead of the real world. Mm -hmm. um, I think this interaction should start from the beginning. I would give a tremendous dynamism to all of it because what I see now at universities, they make fantastic research, they have fantastic uh, projects, uh, but uh, business building is not the name of the game. No, no, but that's basically what you... In EMEC, there are 6,000 inventions on the shelves. Yep, yep. But it's still, it's still old school. And when I tell them, yeah. why don't you hire 100 business builders with technological and marketing and financial capability mm -hmm. and do business, they put their hands in the sky. Yeah, because I remember because when they, don't I do they are interested in your research. When I created the first spin in Leuven, even by my own professor, Karl Tavni, who was also the administrator of the University in Leuven, he pointed at me as dirty businessman. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And still the mentality is there. And that's why my last uh, remark is, how come that two, three guys in America are able to create a Twitter, to create a Facebook, to create uh, whatever, there are not two to create guys. Google, and, and that we, with double the people here, uh, and, and we are the old continent, and so on and I so forth. I can so show you that there are never two, three guys. Never, ever. Well, all multinationals started with the idea that's what I like. one or two it's guys. It, it, that, that's the same, sorry for my word, but that's the same bullshit as saying that every uh, startup uh, starts in a garage. It can start on a kitchen table. It's it can really start, yeah. see? So the thing is that two, three people, that's totally, totally an illusion. It, it always starts with two, three people. Cool. Everything starts. That's what I if, I, if I go back to this part, right? Uh, I've tried to explain that when you go to concerts, very few people. But as lo uh, the, all along the way, it becomes everyone. At this phase, it's, it's everyone. Uh, if, if we think about enterprise like the East Indian company, it's, it's, it's a nation, right? It's, 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 it's global. Uh, if you think about frameworks, Wikipedia, uh, whatever, uh, it's global. So what you see is that you start with individuals, you go over to groups, prototypes is always with groups. I can show you every case I've seen so far, uh, there's there's no one exception. It's always a group, yeah, like a, a group of not uh, ten or hundred people. No, no, no. Mostly, you mostly, mostly three or four or five. Anyway. But they are a group, and that's well, that's important. Yeah, that's evident because my idea is that if you bring two people together, you have four brains. You have the individual brains and you have the interaction, interaction yeah. between the brains. So even so even two people, people can be a group. You have but the exponential. Uh, but it's important uh, here that you see group dynamics. If you don't see group dynamics, you often don't see a prototype. And often when, when, when a concept, when, when one individual has been developing something very good, the, you, you directly see other people flocking to it and then yeah. you have a group. So it's, it's always the same. With the products, it's the same. If you don't have an organization around the, the, the technology or the service or whatever, you don't have a product. Yeah. And you don't have those dynamics. And what happens with a product, and that's very interesting, because then you see people flowing in and out of the system. In this case, it's, you cannot disconnect the developer from the prototype. If, if you, if you uh, kick out the, 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 the main developer, there's no prototype anymore. Mm -hmm. In this case, if you kick out the developer, there's another developer, which you have trained, you have uh, uh, taken into the system. Like big organizations, they really have a flow of people get coming in and out all the time. So that, that's what you see. You see that this, this novelty that, that starts with a concept and this moment is becoming a lot more robust and less dependent about individuals. And in this case, it's, it's really like almost out of control, let's say. Um, so, but, but you, need to, you need to see that shift. It's, it's products, uh, organizations, how big can they be? Some organizations are 10 people. Other organizations are 10,000 people. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a long range depending on what you are doing. I mean, if you are doing a software development project, then people can be a, an organization. If you are doing a, a biotech, or uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, the petrol uh, drilling uh, thing, 
yeah, then, then you need probably an overtargeting people. It's, it depends on the situation. So the situatedness of your issue is always very important. Yeah. But anyway, my bottom line is always as an economist, uh, where are the results? Ah. And uh, from that point of view, uh, and of course what you what we don't have to admire America because uh, probably 80% of all the new things come from uh, immigrated uh, PhD guys from Europe who, uh, or from elsewhere in the world, or go to the United States, or because if you only have never have been in America, for you America is a, is a dream country for them. Yeah, and but that's why, I, why that if, I think that if you look at the spreading activation in the, those systems, you see that they are very good at that. I, I've seen it also in the that ecosystem I was involved with, is that the, 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 the American people in there, they're a lot more entrepreneurial, but what you see is that they are very much interactive. I, for me, it was no problem contacting them and, and getting an interview with them. You know, but you have the American uh, Americans from wherever they originate, they only have one language, they only have one conviction, we are Americans. And if you look at Europe, we are 27 countries in which each country we have 10 regions or three regions who fight each other. So I mean, that's no, but it's not even that. I mean, I, I've been uh, bringing together people from uh, from Flemish part and the, the Netherlands, and there's a cultural difference there. And what you see is the way that the one is actually approaching the topic doesn't appeal to the other. So so they they, they are showing that and they are simply like blocking it already. Well, what, what I've seen in, in that ecosystem is that whatever, it's more opportunistic, but that allows the spraying activation to become more active. Like, I, I'm going to give one example. Uh, it happened, um, okay, I don't know the year anymore, but it was a conference, uh, one of the first uh, conferences we had over here uh, in Brussels uh, in, uh, about Drupal, and there was the, uh, the, um, uh, guy, the head of the ministry of, of the, the the federal region, who was who was uh, uh, complaining about the multilingual abilities in Drupal at that time, and he said it does not work. It's not working. It's uh, uh, there's an error here. There's an error over there. And he was standing there with the founder of Drupal, and they were like, "Oh, but that works. No, it, it's been implemented by them." So and they take up other people there who were running around in, in the in the open space. There were there was a small conference. So picking up people and starting to understand the complexity of the problem. And so suddenly he said like, okay, stop. We're going to have a meeting in two hours. And I had something like, well, is this a way to just block the discussion because we cannot get rid of it? No, two hours later, there were like, just put it online, right? But all the people in that, in that, in that ecosystem knew were so much with the digital thing busy that they knew that they, this meeting was important for them. And uh, two hours later, we had a meeting with over, I think it's 25 people, and I've never ever saw a meeting being that performance uh, related to development. And you see that the developers uh, explain the issues, the business owners in the room uh, start understanding how to make uh, time free for the developers to be able to do that, and you see the, the whole self-organization happening where business people start talking to the business people, the developers start getting to room doing the development, and they were just saying like, okay, so we're gonna do the development, you, and then to their boss saying like, you make sure that they, uh, 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 make sure that I get, have the time for it, okay. And they, everyone was very self-organized. But what you see is basically the spreading activation. It, it's, it's flickering all over the place. And what I very often see in, in, in Europe is that that's missing. You try to get things mobilized, try to get things in action, it's, it's very hard. Any other questions? Uh, well, I'm trying to get a general view of your concept of the interversity, and it's not quite a concept that I have. I think on the one hand, it's very abstract, this kind of model. On the other hand, you saw from a very concrete case, your experience with students. And like that, I get kind of get the impression that you have kind of overlooked lots of aspects of a university. Uh, this seems very much driven by kind of applications in society. Now, I agree also with him that it would be better if the university would get much more input from society and feedback from society. But on the other hand, there are also still things like fundamental research, theoretical science, general education that also need to be done. And I don't quite see how it fits in this 
framework. That's interesting. That's interesting. The thing that I, you're right, uh, the, 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 it's, it's spread I like to do. I like to be with one feet uh, uh, concrete in the dirt, and with, with the other feet the, the most possible nice architecture, and, and, and trying to create that spread. And then based on that spread, I try to fill in what is between it. But you're right, if you look at it conceptual, there are things that don't fit in there. <laughs> and the way I would approach that is that this is basically a way to, to start things, right? And um, uh, I guess that many of the things you're, you're, you're mentioning right now uh, would be the bigger challenging, challenges for this system to, to then figure out, like, once you started, how do we do that? Um, I, I'm going to give some simple examples. I know that uh, the first telephony uh, was basically used for rich people to, uh, to talk over their estates because you could use that for a short distance, but it was a problem for long distance. And it took really, oh, uh, um, I think it's, it's uh, several decades before they have uh, solved that hard problem. But by actually having uh, some concrete niche to have something working in, what, without waiting until they have the optimal solution, they could have they they've been able to grow it. And yeah, they had this network all across the world. No, no, before I, they, I, I actually so I don't I don't know how how some of the harder like the things you mentioned are. I, I, I think that I the problems know. I'm speaking about are actually the easier problems to solve uh -huh. because this <laughs> requires a coordination be between many different actors. Well, the MOOCs, to give one example, mm -hmm. it doesn't demand much more than that professors would put their courses online. Now we True. all agree that MOOCs are not sufficiently self-organizing. But the original idea of the Sigmodic University, as I saw it, it's kind of a knowledge network in the style of Wikipedia, but more educational, better structured, uh, more clearly structured. That self-organizes to an interaction between professors, students, uh, tutors, PhD students. But isn't that already possible here? It is possible, yes. yes. But I don't see it anywhere here, because what you kind of assume is that the students would create their knowledge while working on a specific problem. But there is still a lot of knowledge that you just need to have a space. It's not just that you're going to, to learn Mathematics 1 because you need to solve this one problem. Mathematics 1, it's something that's basic education that you will need for everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got, I got what where... what sets yeah. are, what vector spaces are, and what matrices are, no matter what you do. No, no, I, I get where you're heading at, but basically uh, that's what I, what, if I, if I look over here, uh, you have the passive videos, like many of the things like uh, the, the basic education, you can, you can actually pretty well automate. Uh, the classrooms you can automate, that's clear. The, the exercise uh, moments, uh, there are some things you can do there. Yeah, but you can automate them, but that's uh, the idea of the MOOCs. You make a perfect yeah. video with a very nice lecture with all the things nice in place, and you said, tell the students, oh, watch that. Mm -hmm. But that's not really interactive, that's not really self-organizing. That's why something like the POEM project, where the whole network of knowledge fragments which can contain some of these MOOC uh, videos, becomes much more self-organizing. And yeah, that for me is the first thing you would want to do in a uni inter, uh, interversity. Now, this is very interesting because that's an aspect that I haven't been working on, but it's the aspect of connecting that to real world problem solving. Mm -hmm. So what I'm thinking about is in terms of the global brain, well, the global brain needs to have its knowledge about how things function. And then you kind of assume that when people need the knowledge, they will just find it there. Mm -hmm. What you are saying is but when a particular knowledge is needed that's not yet available, in this interversity or in the global brain, then you let the students solve it while interacting with the problem. I think that's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is that the, what, what you're saying, like the, the, I think that what, what you see with MOOCs today and with uh, educational innovation today, that many of this, the, the parts that, that the simple solutions are being solved. Uh, they are creating, for example, uh, more uh, interactive uh, classrooms where where uh, where you have the videos to see, but then you can actually make exercises in groups around specific teams. So mm -hmm. the thing is that I've, I've been trying not to get into that because I know that there is already a lot of development over, uh, happening. While I guess that with, with the, the difference between the three pillars, there has been less uh, development, like 
trying to understand no, no, how no, it I, works I, for research. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That, but this, I think this is yeah. a very revolutionary and it could be implemented. But I think there's an intermediate level. Yeah, okay. Let's say there is a classical level that's automate and make traditional uh, lectures more interactive. There is a level where you are speaking, where you are really getting your hands dirty uh -huh. and you're solving real problems in the real world. And there is an intermediate level where the knowledge that is being taught self-organizes and develops partly by the input from top-down, from professors who clean up their courses or who have new research uh, results that they want to put into a more educational format. Partly from the bottom up, the students that make clear what they need, what they have found maybe, that made themselves have, have ideas. And that's what I like so much about the POEM project, is that it's, it's kind of in between. And I think that should be in, in, yeah, integrated with your proposal. Yeah, 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 okay. No, definitely, yeah. yeah. <coughs> oh, I just haven't been looking at it yet. That's, uh, <coughs> Just because I wanted to do the spread first, go to the one extreme, yeah, the other extreme, and then move along. In that sense, that what you are talking about, I wouldn't call that interversity, because it doesn't it doesn't say enough about what the more traditional university tasks. You know? You're speaking about the newer tasks, as you say, the public service, the spin-offs, but not everything can be put in a spin-off. Ah, well, that's you a, cannot that's a debate. teach mathematics. Ah, well, well that's a debate. Enough. That's a debate because, for example, um, you have today experimental archaeology, where I see uh, a very situated way of doing simulations. Like uh, we, we've been talking about it before, that uh, they, they recreate villages or they recreate battles during certain periods in time, trying to keep it as authentic as possible. So what you see is that archaeology is starting to become, which is normally a very Okay, it's practical but pretty theoretical. Uh, it's now actually becoming a very engineering discipline. And I think that if, if I look at it, every discipline can be an engineering discipline. And that's, that's a little bit, um, that I think is a very revolutionary idea, is that you, you can actually say that, for example, if you think about social science, political science, I think about social engineering, political engineering, that becomes possible, like social engineering becomes even more possible with social networks already. But if you create mediums, you can actually create um, simulations in that. And the experimental archaeology is the most extreme case where your medium is actually the physical world and where you actually have limited all your technology to mimic uh, uh, a historical uh, situation. No, but I, I agree with you that that is a very nice innovation. But the problem is that the whole knowledge we have developed over the course of millennia mm -hmm. is simply so big that you cannot just put it all into this kind of interactive, concrete, real world. You're not going to create a, 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 a virtual uh, room in order to teach uh, students the gamma of Latin. That would take an enormous no. long time. No, but you can. You're not going to create all kind of pyramids <laughs> and other uh, buildings no. in order to teach. Uh, no, you, you, need to, you need to know what what the minimum uh, conditions are. Like for Latin, but take for example, uh, there are communities talking uh, Elvish and uh, talking uh, strange languages they made up. But what you see is that there are events happening, conferences, and during that conferences. Everyone speaks that language. That, that's another issue. You can actually create a simulation no, by no. creating a conference. No, it, it, it's interesting to do that, but it's not the most effective way to give students the basic knowledge. What I mean by basic knowledge is there are so many important things that you need to know in order to be able to understand the world around you that some of those will become more interactive by participating mm -hmm. in projects. But Simply there are too many shortcuts, you wouldn't want to go people to having to learn all that by experience, by actually interacting with something. You don't want them to learn the rules of grammar or uh, the, the basics of mathematics or uh, the vocabulary of a language by participating in these kind of interactive conferences. It would but take but you learn time. all them by, by doing exercises, right? Yeah, but the can, can you learn something without the exercises? Yeah, but the exercises are, in, in the end, they are very much simplify the kind of, you give an exercise like you give somebody uh, uh, an English sentence 
that has a grammatical mistake in it and you say, well, now correct it. Well, the things like that uh, exist where, where you, you get a distributed editor. That, that's the thing you can do. Like you have a system where, where you actually use it also for, for beneficial things. That, that's a little bit if what I've been trying no, to do no, no, with. No, I mean, I, I agree. If it's possible to that, learn that's something what I'm trying to do while, this. while solving a concrete problem, it's very nice. But if you would always wait until you have a concrete problem in order to learn what you need to solve it, then it, <laughs> your learning would no, take no, no. a very long but time. If you think about like this course, uh, <laughs> it's, it's about risk management. They could create any kind of project around it. Uh, around things that they interest them. But what you see, and I think there the, that's the essence, is that by actually creating more structured information around it, saying that it is uh, what kind of type it is, like a model, and what kind of level it is, basic or normal, you can actually start navigating through it. Like if, I'm, uh, if, you, if you do that with mathematics or languages, you can create any kind of uh, things over here where, where you have other students evaluating other students' uh, yeah, tasks yeah, no, that's if the they are at the same okay, level. No, no, that, that's that, that that self-organized no, by the peers. That, that, that I agree. But what it's added are these tags. I've seen how the developers uh, have been able to, to develop distributed by having these issue queues and having these this tags on it. And I saw the stigmatic value of it, and I just accepted it, so I've used it for education, and changed some of the things so, so that it would fit more what you need to know for education. Namely, is this a basic course, a normal course, an advanced course? That's a very simple categorization. And if, if you can do that with like many of the courses, you, the, the, I think this is basically the, 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 the contribution I want to do to the education part. You can split up uh, any exercise into an issue, and, and have this, this extreme issue queue uh, for students to work on. And then you can, on top of that, start adding uh, smart algorithms and, and other things to create suggestions. I mean, if I think about your experiment you did with, with, uh, with the food and the categorizations, right? Uh, that, that you ask people, if, is this a fruit or a vegetable? Mm -hmm. uh, we can start doing that with, with such issues if we know how to tag it. And ask the student, is this, is this uh, uh, a question uh, for statistics or is this a question uh, uh, for economics? And, and, and but first you need to know the basics yeah. of economics and statistics. So every time, depending on the level, students can guess. And every time one level be high, higher, you can use that as feedback to, to correct. Yeah, but it brings me to the idea by hearing your mm -hmm. academical discussion that, uh, well, is the academical world at the moment really uh, so up to date in all its systems that it is uh, yeah, ready for the 21st century? No. no. Uh, <laughs> I, I have the impression, and I, when I hear this Minister of Education talking about, uh, I mean, the real guys reorganized not university level, but uh, the middle schools, or what you call that, yeah? or high schools, they have organized it five, six times. And still, uh, I mean, what's the content of it? Uh, nothing, it has nothing to do with the real world we are living in, True. and certainly not with the, the world we are going into. Because we are going to into a world where Europe will be the Abendland, the evening land, you know, and where we have, we'll have our, the guys behind us, we'll have to do a lot of work and go to work probably in other areas, geographical areas even, but certainly in other languages, than we have now in Europe. Uh -huh. But if you look at the high schools and all that, what they are learning now doesn't prepare them. No, true. Far away, if I tell the Minister of, of Education, you have to learn languages, not Latin and Greek. We, uh, I mean, that's so for, eight, for eight uh, years. Russian, you mean? Let them learn Chinese. Let them learn Arabic and probably also Portuguese. Well, you, you, you already have there a, food, <coughs> a bootstrapping problem because you need the teachers uh, to start doing that as well. Import so. them from these countries and you the autochtones. Uh, we have uh, 200 different languages here. I'm not sure which language you're going to learn them. They are all on pension or they uh, are on uh, social security. So let them work and uh, set up uh, teaching well, you can, for languages. I mean, for, to give a concrete example of uh, the way I see uh, we can break into the classical university structures by, by focusing on the, the pain issues they have today. 
for example, I actually been talking to one of the Flemish uh, uh, representatives uh, a few days ago, and she mentioned to me that uh, the, the, the problem of uh, the, in Belgium, because we have this open university system, yeah. we still have the problem that the first uh, uh, bachelor only 50% uh, percent, uh, succeed. And they don't want to uh, integrate uh, the, the uh, pre, uh, prerequisites. So what do they? So they, they have there a very concrete pain issue, and I see total possibility to with, with my system to, to 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 have an opportunity there yeah. to 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 have uh, students work on on this like uh, what is called a brick cursus kind of uh, structure. Instead so of, instead of adapting our, our complete educational system starting from high school and university for the future, they just stay at the place. Yeah, of course. And the world goes. So fast. I know. Forward. The each day we get further and further behind. And nobody does anything. So I think in university you yeah, would do a bit that pessimistic. Uh, well, the, 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 the very strange thing is normally if you see things collapse, um, there, there, there is like a, a new startup. Things start uh, from, from, from what I mean. The problem is what you're describing is we are in a situation where we are in danger of getting the collapse. And I, I can agree there. But uh, we actually recently had collapse with, uh, around the banking industry. And what you see is that they start doing business as usual. So I'm, I'm th there I'm starting to get worried. Because normally I expect once things collapse, that things will grow new. Like if you have a forest fire, yeah, OK, that's very uh, sad because everything will be ruined. But it's, there is earth. And in the earth, you actually recreate new life. But in this case, it's become so virtual that once it collapses, it still exists. There, I, there, I'm starting to get uh, questions. But like the things you are saying, like our education system, if it doesn't work, and we at a certain moment all get confronted that all of us need to learn Chinese and we don't, well, yeah, okay, we're gonna be in trouble. But anyway, I don't point only in a two university, no, no. two early education system. I point also to, for instance, the European Union. Of course. I mean, and I can be very concrete. Ah. If I look in the sector where I'm working in yeah. telemonitoring. Yeah. And that's how I became friends with the commissioner, the former one, Dali, uh, who has been to Hans probably and was thrown out for that. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, in eHealth, the European Commission has spent 1.8 billion euro. 1.8 billion. If you want it in old Belgian French, <laughs> it's tremendous. Sum. Well, when I started with my company some years ago, I contacted all the consortia that had what consortia even spent 30 million in this sector. So I contacted all the consortia and no one could come up with final results that were usable to build on my own operational technologies already without European money. Can you imagine? Yeah, I can So that uh, I don't talk about Belgium, I don't talk about uh, I look at the whole European structure. In fact, I worked as strategic man of European coal and steel community in the beginning of European coal and steel community in Luxembourg in the 60s, when you we were not born yet. <laughs> you know, <coughs> while uh, then we were day and night, but it has degraded until uh, a profitaria. Self-fulfilling prophecy. You're getting into your own uh, virtual world. Basically. Well, I left university because of what you are discussing about. I mean, that uh, after I had uh, created some spin-offs, and you are you are indicated as a dirty businessman. How do you like to stay at university then? You know, if even you know. Uh, <laughs> you see, so we have to rethink tremendously, and uh, like you, have beautiful structures, mental structures how we could start in an essential part, I think I would, it would work it out. And for instance, for the university, one operational system would be that you don't have PhD students, but you have groups of PhD students, students and assistants and professors that are teams and that work on one or two projects and that interact with each other. And these teams, you know, you can let everybody make his PhD, but the one makes his PhD in marketing, the one, the other one in technology, the other in ICT, but it all fits into each other. That's why I want and, to do it. And this. that would be if you create such brain centers or centers of excellence, then the university could really be a regeneration power in our society. 
you know. I think it, it happens partially, and we are doing it in our research groups. So. Very good. Congratulations. That's why I came from Leuven to Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> to the free university. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the thing is that uh, I kind of that why I want to focus on this project oriented approach because you you, you kind of uh, are able to come tr truly interdisciplinary. For example, if one of the teams would be uh, creating a, a device for healthcare, yeah, um, and link link this. Well, let, let's take it as a case. Link, so take link this technology device. So it means you can have you can have uh, people inside uh, medicines that want to look at uh, yeah. technology ability. You can look at people in engineering who, who need yeah. to get more involved in yeah. medicine. Yeah. You, can, you can look at uh, social engineers who want to understand the social application. Okay. You can look at the legal uh, students who need to figure out the legal aspects of it. And all depending on the different topics yeah. can actually, the, the skills that they need to learn anyway can be applied to this spe specific project. And you create a real interesting mix of, of interactions. But therefore, you need a system. That's what I'm trying to, to create. So there is a basic level of, let's say, the bachelor level. Master level is kind of in between. And then you have the PhD level, where students are supposed to work autonomously. Yes. And there, your system would perfectly fit. It may work to some degree at the master's level. But at the bachelor level, they no, still no, need to have the basic no, that, that's education. What you see. They need to have the. If, if you see at this diagram, if I'm talking about spinning off uh, ecosystems, I involve the master program and the PhDs. No. That's the level I'm involving. Okay. You need the basic already. So I agree that the thing you're saying, like the, the more classical thing from, from university, I didn't yet get into because I first wanted to tackle this hard problem. You could have and a then few projects like that at the bachelor's level, but. You should not make no. the whole of your education. No, 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 no. no, no. no. As this you go towards the PhD, this kind of project should become the main thing. This is the idea of making At the PhD lower level, they, they they, they, they should still uh, learn things in a more traditional level where yeah. they're not working on a concrete problem, but on the basics of the domain. Yeah. But, but there I think that the, the MOOCs and the development that, that are happening can already be, be very uh, educating and helping. Yeah, but they're not self-organizing. No, no, we need to add the self-organizing part. But I don't, I don't consider it a, a, an extreme use uh, challenge uh, to do. We, we should uh, be close to, to being able to do that, I guess. Well, if things like Poland would succeed, yeah. Yeah. Well, this this idea is uh, part of uh, how do you make uh, a current uh, uh, spin-offs massive, and how are you able to approach the radical part, which are at the moment uh, out of reach. But one cases. problem I still have with your spin-offs is that I cannot believe that every student or every group of students will actually spin off something that's commercially viable. So you oh, I'm not talking about commercially viable. Yeah, so you should also think about, uh, let's say, public service. Of course. Some ministry somewhere has some problem, some NGO somewhere has some problem, and the students may solve it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that this was a commercial project, for example. Uh, oh, oh, it's left. Right, wait. There was this one about fair trade, which wasn't uh, commercial at all. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, not sure. If this was basically a hobby project, which wasn't really commercially intended. Uh, not sure if this can be commercial, but uh, this fair price was was clearly someone who was uh, very interested in, in development, aid. and there was no there was no uh, commercially uh, uh, in incentive in this project. But the, what, what is extremely important for me is to find a way to validate uh, education in such a way that I can maximize uh, the, the involvement of the students. And what I wanted to do, and that's the first thing I always tell to all my students is, put a part of your soul in this. Because that's the way you're going to be able to find the motivation to truly understand the hard parts and, and learn, really learn. If, if you need to learn something where you don't understand the relevance of it, it's very hard to motivate. Well, if you can actually put, like, uh, if, if they can put part of their soul, like in this case, the guy wants to really do something for fair trade, and I can use that uh, energy to actually make him uh, consider some uh, hard uh, Monte Carlo uh, uh, 
uh, uh, code and look at the code, then that's perfect. So, but I, that's the thing I'm saying. Like, that's why I started with this, this first uh, uh, drawing, where you see that these are kids today. I mean, well, not so really no, 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 it's, no, it's a caricature, the, right? No, mostly they are sitting with their smartphone. No. Yeah, but yeah. If, they, if they would be doing yeah. something something useful with their smartphone related to the course, it would be perfect. Well, anyway, when I have meetings, no smartphone. No? no? Oh, because I when actually I, when tweet... When they are in when a meeting with me, it's in a meeting. <laughs> and uh, then they are not working with others. Otherwise, they go out of the company. Finish. Come on. On the other hand, if I cannot reach them, while they have a smartphone, then... They also are. Yeah. There's also a sound, you know. <laughs> so you better not reach them when they are meeting with you. Huh? Radical. <laughs> but, uh, I would but like to ask the opinions of the other people because there are only two speakers, three who speak, and uh, what, ah, what well, is the opinion yeah, of the uh, other people present? It's the eco style, right? You know, just if you have majority. a question, bash it in. <laughs> huh? Is there, are there any questions? Come on. Yes. Yeah. One question about research. Not all research can be claimed according to this abstract, uh, abstract innovation machine that you have drawn. True, and yeah, of course. String theory, there is a debate whether it is a, a, a nothing or a something. Uh -huh. So nobody knows. Maybe it will be the basis for interplanetary space travel in the far future. Right now, we don't know. Still, Sam, so why don't you, you develop don't it in the far future? Erase, you don't want to erase the potential for this. Yeah, but wait. Why don't, we, why don't we develop it in the far future then? Why do we have to develop it now? Because you don't know. It. The far future will never come if you don't. Know. Know. Yeah. No, no, no. That's exactly research my my whole research. Is, uh, my whole uh, research is about novelty. It's about trying to understand how do you approach the things you don't know, and and they all come back to the same thing that. Uh, for the same, I mean, there are so many examples in the past uh, where uh, this kind of tumoric development of uh, some, some strange virtual thing has led to nothing than, than, than the, the very few cases where it did lead to something. But those very few cases are so important that you want to have 99% yeah. failure for each 1% that succeeds. I, I want, mean, I want to have Einstein with his theory of relativity, according to your thing, he should have been busy with more practical no. uh, things. Yes, but then we would have No, because he was, he was busy with a very concrete... Uh, uh, well, the, 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 general, the, the general theory, I can... General I can relativity is not a concrete possible. I can still, I can still debate if, if that's very, u uh, very useful today, but... Um, yeah, but you don't know it. No. But do you know, do you know how many... Uh, it's, it's like in, in any discipline, there, there, there has been things developed by... I mean, the, 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 the biggest problem I'm having is that there is a trend and that trend decides where the finances go. Um, like uh, string theory is very hot. Why? I mean, I'm pretty sure there are many other researchers out there yeah. that have as, as less possible application as string theory, and they are neglected. So the question is, why string theory and why not one of those authors? String theory was given as an example of something which is suspected to be completely Unuseful or perhaps even not scientific right now. No, right, exactly. But but uh, to put it in different in, uh, in a more theoretical or conceptual sense, uh, my criticism about what you presented is that you sh you, you build a certain machine, which is a cybernetic machine that involves education system, inter what you call university and society. And there is a feedback system. How problems or needs of society are translated into a whole process where uh, it provides some answers, good answers, as products, innovations, etc. But what about all those things that we don't know about, that are not useful and cannot be framed in terms of problems, products, future products, or even concepts? But I never, I never claim that that this should replace all existing universities. I believe very strongly in diversity. But the thing that I'm wondering is like, um, I, I find it more logical that there would be small groups with uh, with few resources 
uh, able to, to produce that and not be something as, as hugely big as the, the whole string theory field that, 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 that has some kind of uh, prestige related to the, the national development, but it's basically, I don't know, it's, it, it's, it looked like a, a scheme to me. I, I've seen it with, with many other projects before where, where there's... No, no, Sting is maybe not a good example because we all know that Sting is a bit of a fad. Too much authority is given to it, but there are That's what other I... developments that people are busy with that we haven't heard of yet, that seem to have no use whatsoever and that maybe in 50 years will indeed make possible interplanetary travel or time machines that we Maybe. don't know. But, yeah, but, but I don't have any problems with that. I have problems if that gets institutionalized like string theory. That's no, my it point. It needs to be institutionalized to some degree because in the old days, the people who could do that is were the people that were rich enough and they did it as a kind of a hobby. Exactly. Yeah, you don't want to be only rich people. Uh, no, but that's why we have structure. Research, that's why we have uh, structures like FAO, where 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 to, to, to make sure that that yes, research uh, keeps on uh, existing with the with peer review to figure out if that person is really well enough to, to do that. So so, but but that system already exists to provide. The, the question I'm, I'm having is that there are today extreme big challenges no, and no, no. everything becomes more complex adaptive and yeah, we have okay. no way to deal with it. No, no but it, it's a way of how you frame your uh, project. If you frame it as inter-university, the university yeah, of the future, yeah. then it's as if you claim that this will be all what the university of the future is. While you are saying, well, we keep all these good things of the university, but we add this thing that is lacking. That's not the same as saying this is this is how the university of the future will look. You will see, this is how one aspect of the university of the future will look, which is totally lacking in present universities. Oh, well, well then maybe, I maybe it. if this would be the, the next generation university, then we need to reinvent the academics. The um, sorry, how do you call it again? Like the the, the, the clubs that existed. Uh, Academ uh, scientific societies? Or yeah. Okay. So you reinvent something like that again? You don't need to reinvent them, they exist. I mean, uh, yeah, so so may give them more a structure that they can actually have the FAO research uh, funds. Yes, but I mean, all this should be for me part of an inter university. But what, what the, the thing is that with the university, uh, by, by creating the third pillar on the university, and making it uh, uh, basically uh, responsible uh, for our societal needs, we actually have changed what it means to be a university. And that's what, I, what I'm saying. If, that's, if the three pillars are what a university has to be, then this university is, the, is an alternative. And I fully agree that that doesn't count the, the fundamental research. But I don't see so much the fundamental research very well um, represented in the three pillars. So you can actually ask if we don't need uh, a different... Fundamental research has always been one of the basic pillars of universities. No, what I see in your uh -huh. proposal is what you're proposing <coughs> is an interface between the traditional university and society. Yes. It's very important that that interface should be formed. Mm -hmm. But the traditional university still has a number of basic functions that you have not addressed. No, true. And when we ask you about it, you say, well, yeah, well, we can keep the FAO or we can of course revive I want to keep the, 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 the scientific society. But for me, the university should be a global view of the university. So I'm just saying you're speaking about one aspect that's very important, but it's not the only one. No, okay. Then, then we need to... Could this be applied to kindergartens uh, amongst Europe, since that's kind of like a crucial developmental stage in, in this? That I didn't uh, include that one picture, but it's uh, one of the uh, things that has stimulated uh, uh, all of my research. It's a, a case called uh, um, called KitCam, and KitCam. I'll explain it. It's uh, it's it's 1997-98. Uh, what they did is they had these small webcams uh, on front of the. Uh, no, no, they had a they had a bottom on front, and I don't. I think the webcam would be above or below, right? And the, so it was a kindergarten application uh, where the kids were asked to push the button 
if they would feel uh, there, that there was any uh, interesting event happening. And so what, what happened is that uh, after they could capture uh, the important moments of the kit during that day and then use that to reflect with the kit. And one of the things they figure out is, you know, that kids have a lot of, like kindergarten kids uh, have problems with abstract things. If you ask them, like, how was your day, they will not really be able to answer a question like that. So what, what you see is that if you actually have those events during the day that they actually have experienced, they can uh, reflect on a, a lot higher level. And they've done that. They show that to kids, like a, a kid falling in a, 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 and, and the other kids seeing it for the second time, recognizing that actually the kid should, uh, has hurt itself. While uh, the kids that fall uh, and sits for the first time find it's funny. So they learn to relativate their, their experience and stuff like that. I have a real high level of reflection. And uh, I think it was with kids between four and eight. I'm not sure if that's still kindergarten, no. Uh, but what you see, uh, you could actually start doing that with kids between one and, and four with uh, arousal technology, where, where you have like uh, simple things measuring your, your surface and therefore uh, can measure if you have arousal or not. And, and then capture the whatever was happening at the moment. But it's again the problem that our memory is a lot less uh, accurate than, than actually if we record it. So what you do is like in, in the case over here, right, where, you, where you're making your brain waves uh, become uh, visible, it's, it's a little bit in this trend, in the sense that you have recorded an experience and then you replay the experience to do recognition. Uh, it, it, it's a very useful way. For me, there was one of the stimulations to understand that we could do way much more with collective intelligence. It's, I, I really love that case. It's a very, very fascinating. Mm. Yeah. Maybe if a kid was uh, training to uh, pink horses or something like that, and he had you know, they can conceive that. No. They can't, can't see that. Yeah, but uh, the dream is also very important. True. I mean, again, I, I'm not solving everything at once, and, and I'm not even claiming that everything is solvable. Uh, but what I just see is that uh, with, with, uh, we are doing a lot of things that can be done a lot better if we actually uh, st uh, take a less conservative view on how technology uh, enriches our life. Mm -hmm. Like, like the kids with the cat, like this case. I mean, it looks very, I can, I can imagine that a lot of people would be scared about this kind of structures. But if you just see the feedback and just see how that, that works, then it's the same with that ecosystem. I see the feedback and the people working in that ecosystem find it the most logical thing in the world. They don't mind that they don't have all the knowledge and, uh, but they, because they know how to find it. If, if they need it, they will have it. So it's not an issue. And you see the dynamics being very different. It's a, it's a whole big ecosystem. Many things are happening, <coughs> and they don't need to understand the whole. They are just happy in the flow. Mm -hmm. And it's difference. It's it, it's difference like being able to, to let go basically and and and, and enjoy the the, the, the the perturbations that that will overcome. So. Yeah. What I see with the kids uh, when you are talking about that that they are much. Since they are born with a smartphone in their hand almost, mm -hmm. uh, and a computer in their head, what I see, you know, that they are so well trained in uh, working with uh, the technologies now available, uh, that they have such a selective brain now, that instead of the us looking at everything, because we think we will find it there, that they have such a selective brain that out of 100 choices, for instance, for something, they know immediately, almost, with quite correct brain, what to choose. And all the rest, they even don't look at it. So that's a good evolution for the young people. That I, I talk about my grandchildren, you know, that they... Yeah, information overload. They are yeah, more able to... A selective, yeah. a very efficient, selective brain in... Because they are overflowed, like us, and we almost... But you know, it's, it's because we, we, are, we are trained in such a way that if we select something, we need to stick to it. Yeah. While those kids, they know that they select, they work with it, and if they decide that I don't like it, they just poof and they go over. But we have been trained that once we have selected it, that's the keeper, 
And it's, 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 it's just a very different dynamic. It's true. It's uh, fascinating. I love to, to see that. That's a positive point I can bring up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but that, that's basically the claim I, I was trying to make with the, the different, showing the difference between the, the education and the research, right? The, like, like those two pictures, right? And mm -hmm. those two pictures, it's that everything is always in motion. Everything is always changing. And the things how it used to work are probably not the best way to make it work today. So you need to adapt and, and figure out ways to make it work. And, and yeah. How is the time? Should we? A last point, in fact, uh, Go ahead. talking about this uh, inter, uh, inter faculty group or whatever and the link with reality, what we also are missing here in Europe. Uh, that's the link from the educational field to industry. True. You know, unbelievable how they, uh, from the early beginning of their first idea, they have their team from different sites, from different specialities, and then they are linked immediately with financial groups, with uh, groups that would apply their technology and so on and so forth. So there is a continuous input. You know, they should apply to all companies in Belgium and in Europe, you know, to be linked. With the, with the school, with the schools, with the students, with the PhD students, with the, the MBAs and the, the bachelors, with everybody. It's a European every, paradox. Every, you know the European paradox? It's, a, it's being written down as a European paradox that, yeah. that the, their uh, excellence uh, on academic levels uh, is good. Yeah. Uh, but their uh, ability to validate it is, is uh, problematic. My, yeah. Sadness element from the 60s left for the century already. Uh, you know, how that, although, with, you know how that is with cultures, they are hard to learn. Although I jumped in a company that was almost broke, and two years later I won the prize of Flanders Technology. Ah, oh, nice. In Edo Tempore, two years before Leonard and Austin. Again, a good example of how it should be done. <laughs> and how it's not picked up at the time. We are hard learners. Well, okay, thank you. Let's change the world. Thank you very much.